Good morning. My name is Felicia Orth, the hearing officer appointed in EIB 21-27. This is a rulemaking before the Environmental Improvement Board on ozone precursor air pollutants. Uh, we are on our final day of hearing and we have come to the 9 a.m. Uh, public comment session. Uh, those folks who reached out to the board administrator and who I will call on right now are James Crawford, Douglas Black, and Karen Cowan. Uh, if you're on the platform and uh, did not reach out to the administrator, that's fine. Uh, please reach out through chat, uh, which is enabled for everyone, and I'd be happy to accept your comment. If you have any trouble with the chat function, uh, please reach out to the administrator, Pam Jones, at 505-660-4305. Uh, public comment uh, uh, is taken under oath, pursuant to the board rules, is taken by audio, not video, and is limited to five minutes. Let me start with Mr. Crawford. Uh, Mr. Crawford, I have unmuted you. Can you hear me? Yes, Oh, gosh, it's hard to hear you. Can you, can you be louder? Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Crawford, we can't make out what you're saying. How about now? Oh, that's better. That's better. Okay, how's that? Oh, that's the best. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, would you spell your name for the transcript, please? Yes. Uh, James, J-A-M-E-S, Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D. Thank you. If you raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. I'm going to start your five minutes now. Okay. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. I am opposed to passing and implementing this new rule. It's an extreme, exa extreme example of bureaucratic overreach with huge economic consequences to the state, to our schools, to our industry, and most of all, to us individual citizens, it has little or no positive benefit. This entire administration has been infected with the brain-eating green virus originating out of California. The ability to reason realistically and practically seems to have been lost. Any science not conforming to the green gospel is rejected out of hand without consideration of weighing of the merits. This is bureaucratic piling on. The methane rule was already passed in May. Do we wait to see what the effect will have? No, we immediately come up with this new VOC villain to further burden our oil and gas industry which will contribute to the ultimate goal of eliminating oil and gas. The chokehold on oil and gas will result in nearly a billion dollar reduction in funding for schools and universities. Every percent loss of production results in millions in revenue losses, so even marginal wells, which are no longer exempt, very important. Thousands of high paying jobs will be lost, Due to the existing rules and restrictions, gas availability in the San Juan Basin has been declining and forcing company consolidations and personnel layoffs. Employees have had to find other jobs and move out of state. My own son-in-law just had to move to Colorado to keep his job. These added rules will only make things worse. The out-of-pocket cost to industry from this rule is staggering. Several billion dollars in the first year and a billion, about a billion per year after that. It's estimated that about 40% of our oil wells or 90% of our gas wells will become, become uneconomical with co corresponding 13 and 23% decline in production. If it were not for the brain-eating green virus, you would all probably know that this rule will have no significant effect on climate or even air quality. The EIB already has files containing pages and pages of scientific testimony 
to that effect from previous cap and trade hearings. I live in Valencia County and it's a mystery why Valencia County is singled out in this rule. You'd be hard pressed to find oil and gas wells in Valencia County. Our pollution is from the brown cloud drifting down the river from Bernalillo County, which is excluded from the rule. Choking off oil and gas production in the Permian and San Juan basins won't have any effect on air quality in Valencia County. Besides the dollar cost, the declining production will cause severe problems with availability and reliability of electricity. Transition to 100% renewables is not possible or practical. PNM has already warned us that we will be facing brownouts because of the lack of backup fossil fuel power. Even California has found that gas plants are the only way to keep the lights on. We need to keep our oil and gas industry going and healthy. This rule needs to be tabled permanently. Thank you for letting me have my say. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. We'll move now to Bruce Black. Mr. Black, I have a- Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, excuse me. Okay, great. Your voice is coming through nice and clear. Would you um, spell your name for the record, please? Yes, B L. A C K, like the color. Thank you. Uh, and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. I'll start your five minutes now. All right. I previously worked for oil and gas for several years as a lobbyist and also a uh, litigator. I'm a lawyer. I was a judge. I'm retired now, but this bill or this regulation has a chance to be a real opportunity for the state. Colorado has implemented something similar and it has proved to be a real boon on several levels. As of now, New Mexico is a real disgrace to climate change and also pollution. From space, you can see a large cloud of methane gas over the four corners and to a lesser extent over the Permian Basin. This is totally unnecessary. If we can cap and trap our methane, we can do what Colorado did and produce substantially more energy. This will result in several positive effects. We can produce cheaper energy because we will be producing more from the same wells. We can produce more taxes for the state. We can produce more revenue for the energy producers. Colorado did this and it was a win, win, win. The environment benefits, consumers benefit, state revenue increases, and energy producers benefit from the captured methane. Because New Mexico has many more small producers than Colorado, we will likely need to incentivize this move somehow with a tax rebate or tax credit from the state to allow the initial investment, which will be indeed substantial. Once it is made, however, it will recoup in many cases within two or three years and certainly recoup within five to ten, even on the stripper wells that are common in San Juan County. I think this is an excellent regulation and needs to be coupled with some type of a tax incentive and capture method to capture the methane and use it productively for our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge. I will turn now to Karen Cowan. Ms. Cowan, I've unmuted you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you would spell your name. For the, hold on. Spell your name for the transcript, please. My name is Karen, C A R E N Cowan, C O W A N. And if you um, I have worked raise, in the. One second. Raise your right hand. Do you okay. swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'll start your five minutes now. Thank you. Um, I have worked in New Mexico in the agricultural industry um, for 35 years now or going on it. Um, and I find this regulation to be not a good one and be and will end up being very harmful for the state of New Mexico and its citizens. Um, in doing some research the other day, I found that 
in 2020, 33.5% of the state's revenue came from the oil and gas industry. I was shocked to find that 42.7% of the state's revenue comes from the federal government. Agriculture puts in another 12, and all of the other industries make up that final 12%. So we must be cautious with those things that can that can provide us the the things that our people that our citizens need. Um, understanding that the oil and gas industry must be sensitive to the environment, and they are working hard to do that every day. But the the part of our budget is irreplaceable um, that that the oil and gas industry puts into to us today. So I think it behooves us to find ways to work with them and make them more successful rather than less. I'm also concerned about the produced water um, and the recycling from oil and, oil and gas projects. Water has to be recycled so that we can keep our fresh water. We all know that water in New Mexico is a precious commodity. Um, the old adage, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, and that's kind of where we are. We've got to fight for every bit of water we have and keep it as clean as possible. Um, I'm also concerned about all of the requirements, additional requirements, I think there are 35, being placed on the oil and gas industry to try to meet. Um, we did a survey, it's probably been 10 years ago, but at that point in time, agriculture was supposed to had, had 31 different agencies overseeing them. It is impossible for anybody to keep up with all of these regulations. And for these reasons that I've mentioned, um, we respectfully hope that this regulation will be set aside. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cowan. I don't have anyone else uh, requesting an opportunity to comment uh, this morning. Um, we have two more public comment opportunities at 1 p.m. and at 5 p.m. And of course, public comment may be submitted uh, in writing to the board administrator, Pam Jones, uh, through through the end of the day. Uh, let's go back to the technical case. Um, oh, wait, sorry. I am seeing something from Samantha Cow. All right, um, Ms., if I'm mispronouncing this, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms., Ms. Cow, can you hear me? Yes, I can, can you hear me? Yes, it's coming through clearly. Would you spell your name for the transcript, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Samantha Cow, spelled S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A. -A -A. Last name is Cow, spelled K-A-O. And I am reading in a comment. Hold on. Would you raise oh. your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. I'll start your five minutes now. Thank you. Um, I'm reading in a comment on behalf of Representative Patricia Royal Caballero. Um, of House District 13. Um, the community within my district has a large Hispanic population who have a high rate of pediatric asthma. And when my son was born, he was born with respiratory ailment that led him to be hospitalized in the neonatal ICU for 10 days. And his respiratory issues have continued into adulthood where he continues to suffer from asthma. <clears throat> I too grew up in an area where the number, where the high concentrations of air pollutants caused me to develop asthma as well. And when the COVID pandemic started, my district had the highest number of confirmed COVID cases. I have been and continue to be a strong advocate for legislation and rules in our state to convert our school buses from diesel to electric in order to cut down on children's inhalation of diesel fumes. Our kids in our communities should not be exposed to pollutants that can affect their health and livelihoods. And the state of New Mexico deserves thoughtful, effective rules that protect our air quality. And I hope you'll consider this going forward in adopting more stringent ozone regulations that have been recommended. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cow. All right, now I don't have anyone else uh, seeking to offer public comment. So let's go back to the technical case. Um, let me ask, uh, Ms. Katz or Ms. Paranos or uh, Mr. Heiser. Uh, does it make sense to start with Mr. Alexander? Ms. Paranos? Let me see if she's on, I think. 
she was on. Yeah, she's on. Ms. Baranos? She may be having uh, some difficulty with audio or uh, video. Um, oh, I see uh, Mr. Alexander joining us on the screen. Good morning, Mr. Alexander. Good morning. How are you, Madam Hearing Officer? I'm good. I'm, oh, there's Ms. Peranos. Um, if you would please, uh, Mr. Alexander, spell your name for the transcript. Tom Alexander, T-O-M-A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R. And if you would raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Peranos? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. If I could have screen sharing privileges, I'd like to share our PowerPoint. Perfect. Excuse, excuse me, one minute, Elizabeth. I'm going to put my assistant out of the room because I don't want her to start barking. No worries. And can everyone see my screen, hopefully? I wasn't expecting to be first up, so, all right, good. Thanks. Um, can you see my PowerPoint now or your PowerPoint, Tom? I can. Perfect, okay. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Alexander, can you please tell the board where you are employed? Currently, I'm a part-time consultant for the Environmental Defense Fund and have been for the past five years. And what is your educational background? Well, beginning in 1973, I earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Wake Forest University and did a little work after graduation at Duke University in Chemistry and Genetics. And then in 1981, completed and earned a Master of Science and a Bachelor of Science in Mining Engineering from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And then I completed the coursework for the Master of Arts on Environmental Policy and Management at the University of Denver in 1994. And can you please provide an overview of your work experience? Well, um, I'll start with current and work backwards. So I've been a consultant part-time to EDF for five years, working on underground gas storage, flaring, venting, conventional and unconventional regulations in some of the eastern states. I also help EDF in their advocacy for the New Mexico Oil Conservation Commission last January when the commission adopted its flaring and venting rule. Uh, also with EDF, uh, helping in its contributions to the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and the Energy Resource Research and Technology Committee. And currently working on two American Petroleum Institute work groups with respect to risk management, health, safety, environment, security, and training. Prior to working with EDF, and that, that happened after I retired from full-time work, uh, I worked for Southwestern Energy for 18 years, 1998 through March of 2016. I began as a full-time consultant and then was hired full-time as a staff production and completion engineer and then named the team leader for the team. Our team actually uh, wound up discovering the federal shale. And during that time when we organized I was the completion manager for three plus years on that project. Then I went to work for SWIN's Canadian subsidiary, SWIN Resources Canada in New Brunswick for a little over two years, 2010 through most of 12 as the general manager. And after that, 12 through 16, when I retired, I was the vice president of health, safety, environment for Southwestern Energy. Prior to SWIN, I worked for Pro New Prospect Company and Revere Corporation in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Habersham Energy Company in Inglewood, Colorado, Southwest Operating Incorporated and Altair Energy Corporation in Tyler, Texas. And then I began my oil and gas career 
in 81 with Schlumberger Offshore Services out of Houston, Texas. And from 1975 to 1981, I served in the United States Air Force as a B-52H navigator and radar navigator and retired as a captain. Thank you. And is EDX Exhibit KK an accurate copy of your CV? Yes. And did you submit direct and rebuttal testimony on behalf of EDF in this matter? Yes, I did. Correct. Is EDF Exhibit UU an accurate version of your direct testimony? And is EDF Exhibit WW an accurate version of your rebuttal testimony? Yes. And do you have any revisions to either of those testimonies? I do not. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. At this point, I would um, move to admit Tom Alexander's um, exhibits and testimony and for the uh, boards and your consideration, his uh, exhibits and testimonies appear at EDF exhibit, exhibits KKVLLMMNNOOPP C C U U W W and V V. All right, thank you. Let me pause uh, for a moment in the event anyone has an objection other than the uh, standing objection. I believe uh, Mr. Rose is pursuing anything else. Not hearing anything else. They're admitted. Thank you. Um, Tom, could you please summarize the opinions you will provide uh, or the topics rather and the opinions that you will provide today to the board? Yes, I will uh, provide testimony on several topics to include liquid unloading, leak detection and repair or LDAR, pneumatic controllers and well completions. First, I support NMED's liquid unloading provision, in particular, the requirement that operators use a specific method to avoid the need for manual unloading. Next, I would say I support EDS proposal to require operators inspect well sites located near occupied places, such as homes and schools. My experience implementing and working with an LR program at Southwestern Energy underscores the reasonableness of requiring operators to check for leaks, and malfunction equipment, using an advanced leak detection instrument such as OGI cameras. In addition, I reviewed EDS analysis for the costs and <clears throat> reductions associated with this proposal and find the proposal to be economically feasible and reasonable. With respect to pneumatic controllers, my experience implementing an LDAR program at Southwestern underscores how reasonable it is to require operators to inspect gas-powered controllers with an OGI camera or similar instrument. And I appreciate NMEDS including this requirement in their September draft. Third, EDS proposal revisions on the pneumatic controller retrofit, retrofit are sensible and cost effective. Technology does exist today and has for a while to retrofit gas fire controllers with non emitting devices, as Dr. McCabe explained in prior testimony earlier this week. And finally, EDF has proposed a safe and feasible economic requirement to eliminate bidding during the initial flowback stage of well completions and recompletions. This rule is based on a Colorado rule that took effect this May and for which the Colorado operators are complying without any safety or other issues. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Um, if you could please describe your experience with liquids unloading operations to the board. Sure. Well, actually, uh, that began in uh, East Texas when I left Slumber J and worked the East Texas Basin uh, was when I first really learned a lot about uh, a couple of particular artificial lift means, one being plunger lift, the other being beam pumps. And during my tenure of Southwestern Energy, I initially had observed a number of different ways that pumpers uh, unloaded liquids from gas wells. Um, and I pioneered the use of plunger lifts on Southwestern Energy's wells in the Arcoma Basin operations. Now that occupies 
Western Arkansas and Eastern Oklahoma. When I started to work there in 95, there was not a single plunger left in operation in the Arkema Basin. We operated probably 350, 400 wells for SWIN and most other operators as well. The typical method that was used in those days to produce or unload liquids to routinely soak and blow the wells to unload the fluid, which is very wasteful of resource and labor intensive. We quickly turned that around within a couple, three years and installed plunger lifts successfully on literally dozens and dozens and dozens of wells, replacing the old method of soak and blow. Thank you. And have you reviewed the department's liquids unloading provisions? Yes, I have. And could you please summarize your opinion of the department's liquids unloading provisions? Sure. NMED has proposed a leading technologically feasible and economical provision to reduce emissions during liquids unloading. It proposes that operators use specific methods or technologies such as plunger lift to avoid the need for manual unloading. And in my experience, all the methods that NMED lists in 17, 117B3 are technically feasible ways to avoid the need to manually unload a well. Manual unloading allows an operator to vent natural gas to the atmosphere in order to clear the wellbore fluids, as you all know, but it is very wasteful, inefficient, and completely unnecessary practice. And in your opinion, will the department's uh, liquids unloading proposal lead to emissions reduction? Yes, and as I noted in my rebuttal testimony, the use of artificial lift or other methods avoids the need to manually unload and vent natural gas to the atmosphere during liquids unloading. That will significantly decrease emissions. And it was our experience and my experience of over 25 years or so. And a simple way to understand the efficiency, for example, of plunger lift is to recognize the mechanical advantage or efficiency to move fluids with a solid surface, i.e. the top of the plunger, versus a gas to liquid interface, which is very inefficient and absolutely no comparison in efficiency. If the gas to liquid ratio is sufficient in a well for plunger lift to work or is not sufficient for a plunger lift, then perhaps a pumping unit is in order, but anything, anything to avoid manually unloading as a, as a routine way of producing a well. Thank you. And did you hear Mr. Ryan's testimony yesterday on this topic? Yes, I did. And do you agree with Mr. Ryan that manual unloading is the last resort? You know, in general, I would say, no, I do not. But I, I really want us to be careful when, when we hear something like that. This is our last resort. I want to be careful to, 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 to distinguish that it cannot be the last resort as a means of producing a well. That just simply is not, it's just not true. Um, and do you agree that plunger lifts can lead to more manual unloading? No, <laughs> you know, if you've, if you've adequately, if you've properly characterized the well, if you understand it's gas to liquid ratio, you understand the reservoir pressure and you don't have a mechanical disaster downhole that is unrepairable. Uh, and then you do the proper design on the plunger and the, 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 the cycle and the settings, and you have a pumper that knows how to operate it, there's no way that, that that installation is going to cause you to manually unload more. Quite the opposite. It will be a whole lot more efficient. Thank you. And do you agree that the department should move the listed methods, such as the use of artificial lift, um, that operators must use to unload a well that are currently in Section 117B3? to section B1, which would make those listed methods recommended best management practices rather than required methods that operators must use during liquids unloading operations. You know, I just want to be clear uh, in, in 117 B3, and I'm looking at it, and thank you, uh, NMED, for putting together the uh, presentation yesterday to get us all on the same page about what we're talking about here. 117.3 or B3 lists the various methods. What I would object to is just taking that 
text away and saying, let's just call those best management practices. If you actually transfer the text of 117B3 and add it to what's in 117B1, we're okay with that, but I would not want that to just disappear and let's all let's call all this a best management practice. And I think that would wind up uh, giving um, manual unloading uh, an unfair advantage as a means of trying to produce a well. Uh, so, so just to be clear, Mr. Alexander, you do support the language that NMED proposed in 117B3. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, if we could move on to the next topic, which is leak detection. Uh, well, just let me. Uh, oh, <laughs> can you go back Sorry. real quick? So, I just yeah. wanted to. To, to, to reiterate some of the main points on this issue of liquid unloading that I, we support the unloading proposal that NMED has in particular with respect to the requirement to use artificial lift in lieu of manually unloading. That's just the wrong way to produce a well. Artificial lift, particularly plunger lift is a, a, if applicable is very, very cost effective. And it has been for decades, a mainstay of production engineering toolkits. Manual unloading is inefficient. It wastes a natural resource. It unnecessarily depletes reservoir energy and it's wasteful of manpower, i.e. the pumper having to stand around and wait for this well to unload. And use of artificial lift will in the vast majority of cases increase production, lead to a higher EUR estimated ultra recovery and enhance the well economics and reduce emissions. That's been my experience over decades of using these instruments. Thanks, let's go. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you could please describe to the board your experience with respect uh, to leak detection and repair requirements. Okay. Well, when I was with Southwestern Energy and after we discovered the Fayetteville Shell, we had literally a, a multiple thousand well program that we were involved with. And we wanted to develop a leak detection program. Uh, so we sought to, to identify any and all avenues where leakage would, would occur from the wellhead uh, all the way through any custody that we had of, of the gas. And in so doing, we purchased six OGI cameras and set up a protocol for identifying and fixing leaks at all of our operated wells and installations to include not just Arkansas, but Pennsylvania and West Virginia as well. And it was very successful. Our Eldor program helped us identify useful information and trends that led to significant emission reductions. Thank you. And, and what kinds of leaks and equipment malfunctions did SWIN's Eldor program identify? Well, it was it's really the whole value chain, starting with the wellhead. Uh, lots of different types of equipment, fittings, connections, and so, and et, so, et cetera, and procedures uh, were identified that led to unnecessary leaks. Uh, and in particular, in the pneumatic controller field, uh, we saw quite a few things uh, that had to do with leaking seals, washed out seats, stuck valves, controller problems, spring issues, bad stem rods, et cetera. Conducting these inspections with a, an OGI camera helped us identify when a particular procedure or piece of equipment was not operating as intended, which then allowed us to discover the reasons for it. And we spent time trying to understand that. Uh, we wanted to be proactive and an operator should be proactive rather than reactive in this regard. We could then fix leaks, replace the equipment or optimize a particular procedure. That OGI LDAR program helped us identify important trends so that we could optimize our operations and reduce emissions through an effective PM program. You know, when you say something like you have a stuck valve, I mean, that's there's more to it than that. There's a lot of reasons why a valve is stuck and you got to take the time and be proactive to figure that out. And we did. It takes a commitment from the operator. It's a cultural thing. But there's no question it can be done and it'll yield economic, operational, safety, and environmental benefits. Thank you. And in your opinion, is um, our audio visual olfactory inspections as effective as instrument-based inspections? 
No, no, they, they certainly are not. AVO is better than nothing, but our, our program, we, as I said, used an OGI <coughs> camera and a protocol to, to, uh, to measure what was going on on a lease by lease or a processing facilities basis. Because by their very nature, an AVO inspection is up to the operator or the pumper to do with, do it with vigilance and as, as well as operators' ability to actually hear or see anything that's going on. Um, and that, uh, there's no way to really document or verify AVO inspections other than just to take one's word for it and fill out a piece of paper. Uh, whereas routine OGI inspections are verifiable and the evidence is physical and can be documented. Thank you. And uh, does your experience support the frequent leak detection and repair inspections that EDF has proposed? Yes, it does. Uh, our experience demonstrated that frequent instrument based inspections could help reduce emissions. And in particular, as I've mentioned before, identifying trends and issues with certain types of equipment or procedures. Implementing quarterly or monthly <clears throat> inspections at well sites near occupied places will reduce emissions of natural gas at locations near homes, workplaces, and schools. An extra measure of vigilance is prudent, always prudent, and it's always crucial to obtain and maintain an operator's social license. Thank you. And did you review EDF's estimate of the cost effectiveness of the Eldar proximity proposal? And if so, do you have an opinion regarding that analysis? Yes, I did. Uh, I reviewed the analysis conducted by Ms. Hull, and I think it's well done, and it demonstrates that EDF's proposal is reasonable and cost effective. Thank you. That concludes the questions on Eldar. So to, to kind of review there, uh, if you can go back one slide, please, Elizabeth. So our program at Southwestern Energy, did, we did identify a variety of malfunctioning equipment that helped us uh, look for trends, optimize operations, and we did reduce emissions. We primarily used OGI cameras. It's an investment, yes, but these instruments are much more definitive and diagnostic than AVO. AVO can't be documented except with a piece of paper. LDAR, on the other, can, other hand, can when you're using OGI. The technique is cost effective and it adds value to social license to operate. Next slide. Couple more points. I support NMED's LDAR requirements and EDF's proximity proposal as both will lead to emissions reductions and more efficient, cleaner operations. And I thank, N I thank NMED for including that. Gas-powered controllers and LDAR. At Southwestern, we identified these devices as one of the major types of equipment that can malfunction. Terrific, thank you. And moving now to pneumatic controllers, could you summarize um, briefly for the board EDF's revisions to the pneumatic controller retrofit provision as you understand them? Well, at a high level, EDF has provided or proposed to increase the number of gas-powered pneumatic controllers that must be retrofit to zero bleed devices and shorten the time frame in which operators must do so. Their proposal is modeled on a rule recently adopted by the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission, which I reviewed in preparing my testimony. In my opinion, EDF's proposal is economically reasonable and practical. Gas-powered pneumatic controllers do vent methane, as you know, and other pollutants to the atmosphere by design. As NMED's proposal demonstrates, technologies exist today to operate pneumatics with zero venting. EDS proposal does not require the use of any new types of technologies that could theoretically increase uh, costs, abnormally so, and rather we simply seek to require operators to retrofit more devices in a more timely manner than NMAD has proposed. It's good policy, we think, and will result in a decrease of emissions from normally functioning pneumatic controllers as well as malfunctioning controllers. So in, in, in summary, again, the proposal from EDF is economically reasonable and practical. Zero emitters are available. Uh, our experience at Southwestern Energy with, other, with over a 4,000 well program in Arkansas, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, uh, where we retrofitted and outfitted with up-to-date equipment over 10 years ago, 
Um, that was more gas to sales, less to the air, and it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Um, if we could turn now to the next topic, which is uh, EDF's well completion <laughs> uh, proposal. Could you provide a summary of our uh, well completion proposal to the board, please? Sure. EDF in conjunction with Oxy USA, Clean Air Advocates, NAVA Education Fund, and the Center for Civic Policy proposed to require operators to control emissions during the initial flowback stage of a well. <coughs> Excuse me. To comply with this, operators can use a control device such as a, an enclosed combustion device. And is EDF's proposal based on a rule adopted in another jurisdiction? Yes, it is. It's based on or modeled on a rule adopted by the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission in 2020. Did the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission conduct an analysis of the cost effectiveness of its rule? Yes, I reviewed that and their economic impact analysis for the rule, and I agree that controlling emissions during the initial flowback phase is cost effective. Could you please provide a summary of that analysis to the board? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, key points. To estimate that, uh, Colorado assumed that operators require 10 to 15 500 barrel flowback vessels at a multi well production facility with 10 wells. And they estimated the cost of each new storage vessel to be 30,500. Cost for used tanks to be between 7,000 and 19,500. Colorado assumed a one time capital cost of 500 bucks for steel piping to install, operate, and maintain at $500. They assumed a 15 year lifetime for this equipment. Colorado concluded that the annualized cost per flowback tank could be about $4,830. Assuming an average of 12 tanks, this equates to an annualized cost of $57,958. Per well site. Now, this is a worst case scenario estimate because it assumed an operator would use the 12 flowback tanks only once at one well site. That would not happen. Most likely, operators would use the same flowback tank at multiple wells for the lifetime of the tanks. And they estimated a 15 year lifetime for flowback tanks, with which I agree. I would also want to say that in, in, in my experience with Southwestern Energy and when I was the completion manager, I mean, we're talking about 10 or 15 wells here and their assumptions, which is fine. It's a place to start. We were completing uh, four to 500 horizontal wells a year with 10 plus frack stages each. Uh, we had our own sets of equipment and we understood the cost. We had it together and this these numbers here are very, very reasonable. Um, and, and like I say, I, I, I would derive my analysis of this from the experience that I had as a completion manager with Southwestern Energy and a major large project. Thank you. And did EDF prepare a cost effectiveness analysis for its proposal? And if so, did you review that? And what is your opinion of that analysis? Yes. Uh, and using the cost estimates contained in the Colorado EIA, Ms. Hull analyzed the cost effectiveness of its initial flowback proposal using the New Mexico specific completion data. I've reviewed it. I think it's cost effective. And in my opinion, EDF's analysis demonstrates the cost effectiveness of its proposal. Thank so you. In, 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 in summary, again, the proposal requires, ah, sorry. Yeah, it requires emission it. control during the initial flowback phase. The phase is not covered. Is this the right slide, Elizabeth? Yes. Yes, yeah. It's not covered by the EPA reduced emission uh, completion rule. It, and, and the proposal, our proposal, is based on the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission rule of 2020. It is cost effective and can be done quite safely. Terrific. And just for the Board's understanding, Ms. Hull will be providing her um, summary of her analysis of the um, EDF flowback proposal, hopefully after Mr. Alexander this morning. Um, if we could then turn to a, um, a few points on SIR rebuttal. 
beginning with liquids unloading. Um, Mr. Alexander, you stated that the department's liquids unloading proposal, which requires operators to use a specific method to unload a well, <clears throat> will result in emissions reductions. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And will it also lead to gas savings? Yes, no question about it, it will. The interface of the fluid tells a story, which I brought up earlier, about the efficiency of moving fluid. Uh, you know, a solid face interface with uh, fluid versus a gas interface is uh, always going to be more efficient than the gas to fluid interface. It's basic physics. And also the use of well design and operated artificial lifts, such as a plunger lift, it'll keep the well producing at a higher and more consistent rates. Uh, that fact isn't debatable. Manually unloading a well, again, I would say, is wasteful of the resource. If you're using this as a routine way of producing a well, it's wasteful of reservoir energy and manpower. Now, obviously, every well has its own characteristics, but there are literally thousands of examples in the Permian and worldwide where artificial lift is the preferred method of keeping a well unloaded and producing efficiently. And again, in the end, uh, a well that is produced properly will have a higher estimated ultimate recovery. Thank you. Um, and there has been some testimony uh, submitted in um, rebuttal, written pre-filed rebuttal testimony that indicates that there are potential safety issues with our Flowbox proposal. Can you speak to that issue? Yeah, I don't believe our proposal really pro proposes or poses any safety concerns. It's based on a rule adopted by the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission, as I said earlier, last year. And the rule has been in effect since May of this year. EDF has dis had discussions with the Colorado AQCC regulators uh, back in August, and no operator has reported any concerns or issues with complying with that rule. And in conversations with Oxy USA, EDF has revised the language of their proposal. The current proposal does not require the use of vapor tight flowback vessels as Colorado does. Rather, our current proposal simply requires that a control device be used to control the flowback vessels operating as a closed event system. I believe that the operation is safe. Now, if, if operators will design and install a, a, and properly operate a pressure release system, uh, bond and ground all equipment uh, to prevent dangerous static buildup and discharge, uh, perhaps use a system of closed flares and have an effective liquid vapor balancing system. Done now as we speak. So I do believe that the system is safe. You've got to do it right, but it is safe. Thank you. Um, and are you familiar with the New Mexico Oil Conservation Division rule that requires control of emissions during the initial flowback stage, quote, if technically feasible under the applicable well conditions, end quote? Yes, I am. Do you believe that this rule addresses our flowback stage of a well completion? No, I do not. The OCD rule only requires control of emissions during the initial flowback stage, <clears throat> excuse me, if technically feasible under the applicable well conditions. But there's a big loophole that gives operators uh, too much latitude, I think. The EDF OXY proposal provides a very clear, in my opinion, safe requirement to control emissions during throughout flowback. Note, that the OCC rule requires capture or control during the separation flowback stage also. Our proposal applies during completions on and after flowback begins. However, given the OCC rule, the only gap we're trying to fill here is respect to the initial flowback stage when neither EPA nor New Mexico OCC require control. Thank you, and you mentioned the <coughs> EPA rule does the EPA reduced emission completion requirement that's in quad OA and quad O adequately address emissions during completions, in particular during the initial flowback stage? You know, EPA's rec rules for oil and gas wells do not require operators to control emissions during the initial flowback stage. 
indeed in the code of federal regulations, they say any gas present in the initial flowback stage is not subject to control under this section. The REC rules also allow for venting during the separation flowback stage. So note uh, that the EPA rules only apply to hydraulically fractured wells as well. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Um, return to the subject of um, low producing wells and uh, shut-ins. Um, in your direct testimony, you noted that the department's rules will in some cases re result in quote, measurable payouts. Could you expand on this? Of course. A number of their proposals require an investment of some nature and quantity. And so in, in many cases, the amount of gas that winds up in the sales line versus the atmosphere will be sufficient to pay out the capital investment over a period of time. Thank you. And you also noted in your direct testimony that, quote, where payout is difficult to define or may not occur, implementing practices that reduce emissions is simply the right thing to do. Could you also explain a little more what you mean by that? Yes, I will. I think too often a decision uh, to do anything uh, tends to be predicated solely on a measurable economic return. The argument is that if one can't measure a success with a discrete KPI or payout or rate of return, then, then don't do it. And this appears to be the case in many of these deliberations. I would submit to you that there are many things that we do in the oil and gas industry that don't individually always have a payout in this classic sense, as I said earlier. Indeed, many times in the entire uh, 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 scenario of drilling and completion production and abandonment of a well, the decisions are based on things such as an operator's risk tolerance, their view of their social license, or just plain old experience in a given area. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are a number of variables in, in, in the process of selecting a casing program or cementing techniques that are going to be used, logging programs, well prep and cutting and completion. The list could go on and on. I mean, we could be here for hours talking about it. And they all have very different costs, and yet we make decisions about these variables and frequently don't attach a number to them in terms of payout. You know, so what do we do as operators? Well, we assemble all the costs in a particular project or a well and decide if the overall return is worth the risk. And so it should be with a lot of these measures designed to reduce emissions as much as is practical. These measure, measures are simply the right thing to do in many cases. These measures are not overly expensive and if wells can't tolerate uh, these modest investments, then perhaps they or a plug-in candidate. Thank you. And are you aware that there has been testimony during this hearing that the department's rules will cause operators to shut in certain older, low-producing wells rather than pay compliance costs? Yes, I am. And as a former oil and gas operator, do you have an opinion related to this topic you would like to share with the board? You know, definition of strippers don't change frequently, and they're, they're not, therefore, generally uh, tied to current product prices for oil and gas. You know, for example, today, if I have a, a, a stripper well that's defined as anything less than 10 BOPD, and I'm, I've got a well that's making eight, nine barrels a day as a stripper, I'd love to have several of those when I'm getting paid $50 for a barrel of oil point here is that to just jump out there in defense of all strippers as they're currently defined may or may not be really a valid argument. I'd be much more inclined to argue a definition or a policy, if you will, tied to current economics rather than just strict production rates. And claims that operators evaluate wells individually always is not true as a blanket statement. For example, if I operate 100 so-called stripper wells that are located all over Hell's Half Acre, then I might very well examine them closely. 
individually as to their economics because it you, you can have a really a discrete cost associated with each of these wells that are all over the county on the other hand though if i have 100 wells and they're in a single field and very close together geographically i'm much less likely to evaluate a single well i will more likely treat the accumulation wells as a single ent entity it's frequently done that way um, for example, case in point, recently an operator in Western PA that operates 2,000 plus wells that produce a grand total, 238 barrels of oil a day. Easy math on that, that's five gallons of oil per day per well. I'll argue there is absolutely nothing that can be done on any one well in that field that is economic in the classic sense or in the sense being argued, but as a whole, they tend to keep operating them. And finally, from a policy perspective, we've got to, I think, keep, quit trying to legislate into perpetuity the existence of every well that makes a sniff of gas or a gallon of oil per day. If we do and continue to do this, I guarantee you state by state will find itself the proud owner of tens of thousands more wells that are, already, that are already orphaned. And the public will then have the opportunity to foot the bill to plug them and restore the land. As we all know, many operators or many states today are already heavily burdened with thousands upon thousands of wells that operators just walked away from. This has to stop and the avenues provided to operators to do this sort of thing has to stop. If the wells that are so valiantly being defended can't shoulder minimal costs and they should be plugged while the operators and the well revenue is still viable. The argument to keep these wells going on and on and on is tired. It's been going on for decades. Look where it has gotten us now. Thank you so much, Mr. Alexander. And that concludes Mr. Alexander's testimony. He is now available for cross-examination. Thank you, Ms. Paranios. Um, would you uh, minimize the slide for just a moment. Absolutely. Okay. Unshare my screen so you don't have to get my horse picture. <laughs> if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> just a <laughs> caveat. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. That might take me a little while. I haven't um, unshared it before. Um, if you are a party with questions of Mr. Alexander, please turn on your camera. Just look up here. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, I see uh, Mr. Heiser. Mr. Heiser, do you have questions? I do, just a few. Um, good morning, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alexander. My name's Eric Heiser. I'm the attorney representing the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association in this. Appreciate the breadth of your testimony this morning. Um, I'd like to start with your discussion on liquid unloading. And I think you talked about the positive experience that you had with plunger lifts. Is that correct? Yes. And um, when you're using a plunger lift, is your, is your point there that that is a, a good general technique to minimize the amount of manual unloading? I, I would say this. If you can actually successfully unload a well manually, it'll probably run on plunger lift. And I would whole lot rather be running a well on plunger lift than manually unloading it. You're, you're, you're just, it's more efficient. You're making more gas. You're not wasting the resource to the atmosphere as much, and you're not wasting manpower. So basically, and my understanding of the plunger lift technology is that it's a way to keep that well running without having to do manual unloading. It's a way to unload fluids, yes. Right. But doesn't plunger lift itself periodically require maintenance and possible manual unloading to continue to perform optimally? It does require annual maintenance. Yeah, you have to run a, a new plunger in there depending on the well conditions and what kind of plunger you're running and what kind of fluids you're producing. Um, sure, that does have a cost to it. And from time to time, you may have to manually unload a well to get a plunger to surface. 
That was my question, is that it's not a way to preclude all manual loading, it's just a method to, to minimize it, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying that you'll never have to uh, manually unload a well if you put in a plunger, but, you, you know, as a means of producing a well, it is uh, hands down better than just manually unloading a well time and time again. Okay. Let's then turn to your leak detection and repair experiences that you had. Uh, you talked a lot about your experience with Southwestern Energy. Is that correct? I did. Do you know what the Southwestern Energy's leak rate was prior to the initiation of that program? I don't. Um, and if you were to have a relatively high leak rate, would that be something that would make the economic return on that program more beneficial than if you had a lower leak rate? It would. Um, you quoted the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division that inspection and record keeping costs are likely minimal for adding pneumatics to LDAR controls. And then I think you said since operators will incorporate pneumatic controllers into the LDAR programs. But New Mexico doesn't have an LDAR program at this point in time, does it? No. So it'd be a little bit higher in cost as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Um and then you also, I believe, quoted their report with approval that the uh, cost for returning an improperly operating controller to normal operation could be up to $600 a year. Is that correct? I think that's the number that I recall. Yeah. Okay. And then um, let's go on and talk about the flowback discussion that we spent some time on as well. Yes. And can you define for me what you are calling initial flowback because I'm trying to understand how early in the process you are trying to suggest that we begin these control procedures. The, the, I think the back end of the process is better defined. I'm just trying to understand the front part of the process. Well, you know, we talk about this initial flowback and then the separation phase. You turn a well around after a frack job and it's flowing on its own um, and it's not, you're not able to run it through a separator, okay? It's just flowing mostly fluids and you're just unloading to a tank. And I look at the definition that New Mexico has here um, following stimulation uh, as either in terms of a uh, subsequent phase of treatment or preparation for cleanup and placing the well into production. Also means that fluids and entrained fluids or solids flowing from a well after drilling or hydraulic fracturing or refracturing. It ends when all temporary flowback equipment is removed from service. Uh, so I would go with the New Mexico de definition. I think as soon as we can, uh, uh, you know, begin to capture emissions and whatnot is, is certainly much better. Isn't that already the Oil Conservation Commission requirement is to do it as soon as practicable? I'm just trying to see if there's actually a disagreement on the point where the separation is put in or if you're trying to control prior to separation. That's what I'm trying to understand when we're still in with liquids and solids or if you're trying to put this in once we begin to produce significant gases. I'm just trying to figure out where exactly you believe we need to start the process of flowing through the enclosed vessel. Immediately, I would. Okay, so from the very soon as we basically pull it out and we begin to produce liquids, that's when yeah. you go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We're just just trying to understand what the actual parameters of the recommendation is. Um, you talked a little bit about um, what would be involved in this and the use of temporary or permanent vessels. Talk to me, um, just explain maybe for me and for the board, what it would look like if you were set up for temporary vessels and then what it would look like if you were set up for permanent vessels. Physically, what would it look like on the ground? Well, what we did, we had mobile flowback units and, and, and equipment that we went from well to well with. You know, you had you had your equipment on location that you were going to use to produce the well once you pretty much flowed the frack back, okay? That is the standard package of equipment that would be on a well. What we had is mobile tanks, mobile separators, and we had a battery of flowback tanks 
associated with it. Those were all mobile and uh, moved around from well to well. By mobile, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry, let me just ask a question. By mobile, did you have them like on skids or on a trailer or were they permanently on a semi truck or? Oh, no, they, they you know, the, it's your basic frack tanks that you, you, you'd haul around behind a truck. You know, it had wheels on it. We would set them over on what we call duck ponds you know, to capture any spilled fluids and, and uh, whatnot and uh, ground them and bond them all together. Okay. Uh, and then you also said that they could be used permanently. Did that mean in the sense of staying at the site or moving around from site to site? Move around from site to site. Okay. And then, so what would be the process? So you've got these tanks. I assume you kept them at a central dispatch yard if they weren't at a site already? We and, did, we had about a 200 acre yard. Okay, so you'd have to pick them up, put them on the truck, haul them out to the site. Then what did you do once you got to the site to set up the site for the this initial flow back? Well, we would spot the tanks in, in a convenient place. Uh, we would also provide for easy loadout uh, for removing fluids and solids. Uh, we would connect with, with chicks and lines and, and various other manifold systems to be able to go right to the wellhead so that we can start moving fluid as soon as, the, as, soon as we were done fracking the well. I mean, okay. I, you want to go through this whole... No, no, and that's, I think that's a, a, a pretty good, adequate thing. But I think you also said you did some bonding and grounding. And then yes. you're also talking about setting up uh, some sort of controlled vent system. Is that correct? To go to your... Yeah. Device. I mean, we, and, and, and I would say too that some of the stuff that we studied in, in Colorado, that the way that they're doing this with uh, vapor and liquid balancing systems and whatnot, it's, uh, it's very ingenious and, and, and done very well. Okay. So, um, is that, under the Colorado cost estimate you have is that that can all be done for $500 a year? Is that consistent with your experience that by the time you did the moving, the placing, the grounding, the putting all the piping in place, the CVS in place, that you could do that for $500 a year at multiple sites? No, 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 no. What, what the 500, so Colorado assumed a, a one-time capital cost of 500 bucks for the steel piping and a one-time cost of 500 to install it in operation and maintenance of $500. So you've got, You've got initial installation and you've got an annualized maintenance of that system. Um, you know, there are three different $500 here, okay? There's one for initial steel. I agree with that. And yeah. One for, it says, for and installation. Installation. And installation. And and then so gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm sorry, one at a time, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Go ahead. Okay, I was just asking whether you thought you could take all the steps that you've laid out for that approximate $500 a year installation of moving, say, 12 tanks from place to place? No, 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 no. That's only with the piping. Okay. Now, you're not going to be able to maintain tanks for $500 a year. Okay. And then are you aware that under the New Mexico rules that have been proposed by uh, the New Mexico Environment Department that for the CVS system, that it also has to have a professional or in-house engineer assess each one and provide an assessment report to the department? I think I recall reading that. Would that add to the cost of doing this? It could, yes. Okay. And I, but I don't disagree with it. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Um, I think those were the questions that I had just to get a better understanding of the scope of your proposal. Thank you very much for okay. sharing your yeah. thoughts on that. All right, Mr. Heiser, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heiser. Any other party with questions of Mr. Alexander? Um, Mr. Rose? Uh, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, Mr. Alexander, my name is Louis Rose, and I represent the Independent Petroleum Association of New Mexico, and I had just a couple questions to clarify your testimony on section 117, which is the liquids unloading. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you're ready. Um, what I was, okay, what I was looking for is clarification of your testimony 
on 117B1. Um, I believe you testified that that you did not agree with Mr. Davis's recommendation about including the methods under D3 in D1. Um, did I understand that testimony correctly? No, here, uh, maybe I can be more clear, and I'm sorry if it was unclear. I, I am in agreement that the methods that are delineated in B3, I like those, I think they should remain. I want to be careful, though, that if we if we just say that, well, they're best management practices, so we think that 117B1 covers those. If we were to take the text of B3 and just add it to B1, I would be okay with that. I just want to be careful that we don't eliminate the text of B3. Does that make, is, am I clear now? Yeah, no, I understand. And I was going to ask you in terms of best management practices, um, what you understand those to be and how they differ from the list in B3. Well, you know, best management practices can mean anything on the earth, uh, and they change with time. I think to be more specific in terms of, instead of a best management practice on how to manually unload a well, I think it's better to be specific about the use of artificial lift or some control devices they stipulate in B3. And well, thank you. That was that was all I have, Madam Hearing Officer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Any other party with a question of Mr. Alexander? Please turn on your camera. No. Uh, in that case, I will turn to questions from the board. If you're an attendee on this platform with a question, please reach out through chat. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer, and thank you, Mr. Alexander, for your um, testimony. Um, it's It's been um, trying to go back to um, a lot of topics that have already been discussed. So um, at this point, though, I don't have any other questions, and I'll, uh, I may have some after some of the other board members if they have questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Trudia Davis. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Mr. Alexander. I appreciate your testimony today. I have lots of questions, <laughs> but um, I'll try to uh, can make them concise here. Um, so I just wanted to to um, clarify a few things um, and, and also to get your recommendation on, on a couple of things. You mentioned that um, that you operated about a thousand wells at one point and you had to retrofit those thousand wells. And so I was curious, how how long does a project like that generally take when you're going well to well retrofitting? Um, okay. Well, let me be clear about how many wells we operate first. We operated more than that. The when I mentioned the Fayetteville shale and the discovery of that, that ultimately resulted in the drilling and completion and production of about 4,500 wells. That took place over for a period of, let me think. You know, that took place over a period of about six to eight years, I'm gonna say. Um, now, during the, the really heavy part of that project, I, I said that we were completing four to 500 wells a year, and that's true. And at the same time, we had operations in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. It was a much smaller project in terms of number of wells. So how long did did it take we we did not experience any backlog of acquiring equipment during that period of time the discovery of the federal shell was in the 2006 range and all of this development took place during uh the next 10 years or so so um how long did it take i mean we just outfitted the wells the new wells with those those types of equipment just as we drill them so uh, and as far as uh, retrofitting, what did we retrofit? You know, we operated at the time that we made that discovery, we operated probably 400 and some odd wells, uh, conventional wells in the Arcoma Basin near the Oklahoma border. So going back to them was, you know, we just, 
Boy, I can't give you an answer. <laughs> you just did it, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess I was wondering, um, you know, since you did you did engage in that kind of project where you went back and you retrofitted um, facilities and wells. Um, if there, you had recommendations on on things you learned from that, um, I would imagine, given that uh, the distance, it, it it took a little while to to do that, and you probably learned a few things along the way. We did. Uh, you know, the major operation for the Fayetteville Shell, for example, was an area about the size of the state of Connecticut in north central Arkansas, and our field office, I mentioned earlier, was a 200 acre or so. Uh, operation and uh, we had quite a bit. Of, it, it was a huge supply chain uh, accomplishment that I can't claim any any part of. I was in the uh, operations side and engineering side, um, and you know the transportation and moving of men, equipment, and materials was a major major deal. Uh, we had an operations center in Conway, Arkansas, and we tracked every truck and every drop of water that went anywhere and everywhere and every piece of equipment. So the supply chain and operations guys did a great job. The PM program that we did uh, with respect, for example, the pneumatics, pneumatic controllers, we worked really hard to try and find out what, well, what breaks and why. And how can we do proper PM so we're not always chasing problems and we can be in front, as I call it from my Air Force days, in front of the airplane instead of behind it. But we did. And again, it, it's a cultural thing and it takes commitment to do it and do it well. So yes. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it, it, it does. Um, you know, as we've gone through this uh, rule process, we're, we're trying to get an understanding of um, the implementation of the rules. So that's uh, I was going off okay. of many years of experience and in, in asking you about that recommendation. And um, speaking of your many years of experience, I'm wondering if you've had an opportunity to work in the Permian or the San Juan Basin. You know, I never did. I worked Texas, uh, North Texas, East Texas, South Texas, but I never actually. We had some small operations in the Permian, Southwestern, but I never was involved with that division. Okay, um, and you were uh, speaking directly about um, the plunger lifts and the practice of manual liquid unloading. I, I'm curious if there is a characteristic of a well in which you would choose to not put a plunger lift on it. Yeah, you know, uh, let me get back to my memory banks. Um, there are some things to think about in terms of qualifying a well for plunger lift. One, the gas to liquid ratio. If you're making, you know, very little gas and mostly liquid, it won't work because you're using that gas energy to remove fluid out of the well, all right? So I'm thinking that the standard formula for it is something like 400 standard cubic feet per barrel of fluid a day per thousand feet. You got that? <laughs> Anyway, that's a rule of thumb uh, in terms of qualifying a well for plunger lift. So, so if you've got a well that's making a couple hundred MCF a day and two, three, four barrels of water and or oil, it's going to run on a plunger. No problem. No problem. Uh, you also got to have the mechanics. The well bore has got to be configured to run a plunger, but that's usually pretty easy to do and inexpensive. Um, it's really straightforward figuring out if a plunger lift will work in a well. Um, so would you uh, would you suspect that if you know a plunger lift wasn't a feasible um, option for a well uh, that it would just be P and aid at that point? No, 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 no. If you if you've got a well that's making a lot of fluid and a little gas then it becomes a, a, a candidate, for example, for a pumping unit, okay? Plunger lift is used in a, uh, in a scenario, it's a, it's a gas well scenario, mostly, as a well is classified as either a gas well or an oil well, okay? So, no, I'm not saying that if it doesn't run on plunger, you got to plug it. No, no, not at all. There are other means of artificial lift to produce a well that is producing a lot more fluid than gas. 
Okay. So um, it, in, in, the, in the spectrum of wells that are out there, is there any um, type of well that would only use manual liquid on loading? And I, I guess I'm thinking of maybe like on a dry gas scale or something on that on that end. I, I will say this. It's not necessarily going to be 100% correct but it's going to be close. If, if you can manually unload a fluid from a gas well, if I can actually do that, or if I have to drop a soap stick to help me out, getting that fluid out of the hole, it will run on a plunger lift. Um, I, I hope I'm answering your question. You are, you are actually, I was wondering, is there a, a column that, uh, like a standard column that a soap stick won't work on? Well, there are different types of soap sticks. You know, some are, are, are better for wells that are predominantly water and some are better for wells that are predominantly oil in terms of the fluid that they produce. Um, and I think to, to kind of go back to your, your, your question about manually unloading, are there types of wells where that is the only way that we can produce it? I would say in general, no, I, I don't. If, if you take a look at any production engineering book, there's not going to be a success, a session or a, a section in there that talks about wells that can only be produced. I would say a well that is a mechanical disaster downhole. And I can't fix it uh, without spending a ton of money. Uh, and, and because of that mechanical problem, you know, we can't run a plunger, we can't run a pumping unit, we can't run gas lift, we can't run hydraulic pump, we can't do anything. Then you may be stuck with manually unloading it, just using a soap stick or something. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. I, I appreciate you answering those, those for me. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, that leads me to my next um, kind of question. At the end of your um, presentation, you were talking about um, abandoned wells and um, you know not being able to, if they can't support their own economics, then maybe they should be P and A'd while there's still um, uh, revenue available for them. And so I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, if we if we include. Um, these stripper wells and marginal wells uh, in this rule of the way that they are currently included. Um, you know, one of the fears is, is that maybe people will just walk away from from some of them if they're uh, if they're not worth producing. Um, is that uh, something that you looked at when you reviewed this rule? You know, I didn't and I not specifically here. I, I am aware that that is a real problem, not just for New Mexico, but other states. And, and I would just say that one of the things that I have uh, from time to time commented on, and I think we got involved with this in Pennsylvania with EDF was talking about bonding requirements, you know, financial surety and assurance uh, is something that that a lot of states and I don't know what New Mexico's status is on this, but a lot of states in the past have wound up in a pickle because they didn't have any leverage whatsoever. And uh, that is an issue over on the east side right now where operators of some sort are coming in and buying thousands of wells from people. And they squeeze the last drop out and then they go file bankruptcy. Here you go. So I just think that, that we need to be careful anywhere we are that the state maintains a position of leverage and that the state doesn't get uh, backed into a corner of legislating wells into existence that really shouldn't be there does that make sense yes sir it, it does and um i would say that's quite consistent with my experience as well um so i, I think you brought up an interesting point on that um well, uh, I think that that's probably the end of my questions for right now. I, I appreciate you taking the time to to talk with us today, and um, I will yield my time to the next board member. Thank you, Thank you. Member Kate. Yeah, um, a couple of questions, Mr. Alexander. Uh, thanks for your testimony, which sure. is unusual. Um, 
in, in no small part because, um, you, you know, you're, you're an oil man, as um, Daniel Day-Lewis said in that movie. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so you're taking a, pos a position here that we haven't heard from uh, much, you know, we haven't heard a lot of um, corroboration along these lines from industry people, uh, perhaps some, but um, I, so, so just my questions are uh, by way of clarification, I'm just wanting to understand that I'm understanding you uh, correctly. So I, I think you're saying that the proposed rule that we're considering, or at least the parts of it that you've studied closely, that it is in fact economically feasible for the industry to comply. Is, is that a, a roughly correct characterization? It is, yes, I would say that. And I add something to that just to be clear. I'm not sure. implying that every well can stand these economics. And yeah. that's why I say if a well can't stand modest yeah. investment to do the right thing, then maybe it needs to be plugged. Right. And when, okay. when, again, when we're talking about the proposal before us, which is, which is uh, complex and there are many components to it, uh, yeah. is it your opinion that um, the, uh, the rule in its totality um, uh, can be sustained by the industry or, or is it possible that uh, those we've heard from who believe that it will destroy the industry, is, is there a possibility that they're correct? Well, I, have, I, can't, I can't comment, unfortunately, on every element of this rule. I'm just not, I, I didn't study it and, I'm, and some of this stuff I'm really not qualified to comment on. Um, so, <laughs> um, but if I had to make a statement and you're asking me to make a statement, what I have read in, in addition to what I have studied and prepared testimony on, I don't see anything in here that is going to destroy the industry. Yeah. Okay. Well, one caller we had this uh, morning, also a former oil man, a uh, lobbyist and a lawyer for the industry. Um, he, he characterized it as a win, 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 because it, um, you know, by his estimation, it, 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 it will help the environment. Um, and it, it'll also force efficiencies upon the industry that will, um, um, to his thinking, actually enhance revenues. And then the knock on effect there uh, would be uh, actually increased revenues to the state. So that's his win, win, win. Does that sound outlandish to you? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, okay. I heard part of his testimony and I would just say to you, sir, that in, in the turn of the century, the natural gas production in this country was on the decline. And the Barnett Shale was the only unconventional resource that, that had been brought to uh, an economic return and, and people thought that was it. But look what happened. Look what has happened in this country. We were number two with the federal shale and then you get the Marcellus and then the Permian blow, blows open again. When you, when you, and, 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 and through all of that time, and I, this is some of the things that we learn and I learn, if you do the right thing, if you're protecting the health and safety of, of folks and the environment, it is almost always economic. And it will cause you to think out of the box and do things that you can't ever imagine. So I'm always in favor of doing that. And we learned it in spades. Our CEO forced it on us and we learned a lot. Yeah. All right. The, the, only, the other thing that I wondered about, you used the phrase uh, in your testimony, um, a cultural thing. And then it yes. came up again later. And so I'm just trying to understand what, I'm trying to get a feel for what you mean by that. Do you mean that there's, sort of an institutional um, uh, re resistance across the industry to additional regulation just because, well, it's a cultural thing. And then, and then maybe you could just elaborate on that a little bit. <laughs> well, I don't think it's, a, it's something that's necessarily across the industry. And I, I certainly can't speak for, for a lot of, you know, the majority of the operators. I, but I would say, I think that the majority of operators really do try to do the right thing. So when I talk about the cultural thing, let me put it this way. And, uh, and we, we 
we changed the company's culture when I was the vice president of HSE. And as a regulator, you'll understand what I'm saying. We want to do the right thing, or we want to follow the rules and the regulations because we want to, it's the right thing to do versus we have to. All right, that's a profoundly different approach. So if the culture is one of, let's do the right thing and let's figure out how to make this work. And we'll discover new ways of doing things and we'll, yeah, I know I can do that. I just don't want to. Well, let's, let's get busy and do it. So that's the culture thing that, that I'll talk about. And that's what we had at our company. It was a vastly different culture. Uh, different from the, the uh, larger. Just doing the same old thing, you know, and it, it, it's, you know, for example, um, you know, in completing these horizontal wells, you know, we learned a lot about uh, interfacing with shale reservoirs. And uh, I had a, a, an old ag engineer on my team and, and he would always say, yeah, but Tom, you know, we've always done it this way. And anytime anybody says we've always done it this way, I guarantee you there's almost 100% chance there's a better way and a cheaper way to do it. So having that attitude, well, we've always done it this way is a failing attitude in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and okay. it is not a good culture. Yeah, gotcha. Well, thank you. You know, your testimony today is, uh, has, has been very helpful to me personally, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Member Bitzer. Uh, the Q&A so far has been pretty thorough. Um, I uh, don't have any uh, questions. Just want to thank you for your service in the big, ug big ugly up there in the stratosphere. So. <laughs> That's all I think. Plane to fly. Yeah, okay. All right, um, Member Garcia. For your testimony, and I, I very much appreciate the great questions from uh, Vice Chair Trujillo Davis and, and uh, Member Cates. That was very informative. This whole uh, session has been very informative. Um, and I guess I would I would I would add one more question to uh, sort of what uh, Member Cates was talking about, which is. I understand there's a, a matter of culture, um, but I also understand that you know business has to make a profit, and if and if they don't, what are they doing? So um, what we've heard from the industry is they're willing to uh, accommodate regulations, and they live with regulations all the time, and they have the federal regulations and the state reg regulations that already exist. Um, but I'm hearing that, you know, be careful, don't tip too far to where we, um, we can't accommodate extreme regulations. And I appreciate that the industry is willing to accept many of these. They've been very accommodating on many of these regulations. But for instance, let me give you an example. The use of plunger lifts, as you talked about, um, it sounded like it was just, you know, so much better um, than the alternative of um, the other alternatives such as manual unloading. Um, so why wouldn't it be used already? Why would there need to be uh, a reg uh, requiring it now? Let me tell you a story. And this is a true, true story. So uh, when I wound up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and that's right on the border of Oklahoma, and uh, we'd be working on wells south of Fort Smith and literally 100 yards over there is Oklahoma. Wells producing out of the same reservoir as what we're producing in Arkansas. And I can hear these words today just like it was, you know, right in front of me now, the pumper. And I would look over there and that well's got a plunger lift on it. And this is when I first moved there. And I said, well, how come you're producing the well this way? Well, it's the way we've always done it. And I said, well, <laughs> it's a lot better and easier to run a plunger lift. Tom, them things don't work in Arkansas. I'm serious. I'm serious as a heart attack. I couldn't believe my words or my ears. And when we first started going around, 
with a slick line truck, you know, running a quick little flow and bottom hole pressure and broaching the tubing, making sure that everything's mechanically okay. And some of the words that came out of those pumpers about don't put that thing. And so the problem was, is that they were being installed on wells that would, you know, wouldn't work if you put a nuclear weapon in them. They were just busted down, not working mechanical disasters, but if you put it in the right well. And so we started installing them and I started getting calls. I was the production engineer from these pumpers. Uh, hey, would you come look at this well or that? I couldn't get out there quick enough. I had these guys calling me and well after well after well. So that's my story. That's what happened in Arkansas. Uh, and I'm sure that's not the only state in the world that that attitude in the field was, it's the way we've always done it. But they found that their wells made more gas, they were more efficient, and guess what? They could go bass fishing earlier in the afternoon. I, I'm serious. I am dead serious. That's exactly what happened. So, there you go. Sir, that's very helpful. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. all my questions. Uh, member Honker. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Alexander, your, your testimony has been very interesting and, and helpful in your experiences uh, in the Fayetteville Shell. Um, in my EPA day, days, I, I dealt with issues in the Fayetteville and the Woodford and, and the Barnett okay. and the Eagle Ford and, and kind of brought back some memories. But being the last in line to, to ask questions, I have no further questions from what my fellow okay. members have asked. Thank you, well, sir. All You're right. welcome. Vice Chair Trujillo Davis, I under, understand you have another question. Yes, I, I apologize, sir, but my background's in oil and gas, so I end up with more questions. Oh, that's fine. Uh, you know, when I started out in the industry, pumpers knew all their wells. They they knew mm -hmm. every piece of equipment on there. They knew how to just tweak the engines just right to make them run and exactly what each well was doing. Unfortunately, nowadays, most pumpers are well, they're lease ops now, they're not pumpers anymore. And yeah. um, they rotate more quickly, so they don't know their wells, <laughs> well, their wells as well as they used to. But um, I always appreciate talking to an old pumper because they got a lot of good information. So Agreed. my question for you is actually more about the economics. Um, I was wondering, the companies you've worked for in the past, would you classify them as, um, a small, mid-size, or large operator? Uh, well, East Texas would have been a small operator. Colorado, when I lived there and worked for Habersham, was a small operator, and then moved to uh, Arkansas. The first couple of companies I worked for were small operators, but then the last half of my career, 18 years, was Southwestern Energy. I, you know, we started out as kind of a medium operator, and by the time uh, we sort of hit our peak stride uh, in 2015-ish, you know, we'd grown that company from uh, 250 million market cap to 16 billion, and we were, I think we got to third largest natural gas producer in the U.S. I mean, we weren't an integrated uh, company, but we were a good size independent, uh, not that big now, but so mostly small, but you know, Southwestern became something of significance. Well, I'm curious about your experience uh, working for a small operator. Um, you know, as you look at these uh, regulations, I'm in, I'm wondering, would you have any concerns if, as you would try to implement them if you were a small operator as far as financially um, uh, or, yeah, I guess that's where I'm, I'm going with that. Well, if looking at the, at the, the, the pieces of this reg that I spent the most time on, no, I would not have any issues with that. Uh, but as far as, you know, looking at the entire regulation I, I can't comment on all of those okay unfortunately. yes but the ones that i spoke about are... yeah the ones i spoke about uh i don't think would cause any issues and again if 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 you can't tolerate doing things more safely 
and more friendly to the environment and, and public health and safety. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the, those wells don't have to always exist. I know that sounds mean, and I, but and yes, I'm an oil and gas person, and I love the industry, but there is a point where uh, it gets to be unreasonable. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, it, it does. Thank you, and I, I appreciate your your testimony today, and so. You're welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, I have another question. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer, and um, thank you, Mr. Alexander, again for your questions and I mean for your responses and to the board members for the questions. And I think I just want to also maybe um, uh, ask you a little bit more. Um, and and it sounds like you have a lot of experience in the industry and working in other areas where and jurisdictions where new regulations were being rules or regulations were being um, developed. Um, do you see that in some areas where industry has been proactive? We've, we, I think you mentioned that where industry, some companies are proactive and based on their culture, if they want to, um, you know, I, I think, as you said, do the right thing. Um, and then maybe for, you know, there's maybe some financial reasons for some businesses to be proactive and use the latest technology or best management mm -hmm. practices, I think you mentioned as well. Um, so, given that, though, for those proactive ones, and I, I want to see if you have a, an opinion about um, in, in your experience, seeing those that maybe aren't as proactive and where regulation new rules or revised regulations help kind of push them along. Have you seen that in, in the work that you've done? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and please don't anybody think that I'm claiming that. San Juan operators or Permian operators in Lee and Eddy County are not culturally great people. I know that there's just tons of wonderful people there. Uh, so a couple of examples here uh, of regulations and pushing things along. Um, Southwestern Energy was on the uh, tip of the spear with what we call green completions. Uh, and, and we kind of talked a little bit about that uh, here, flowing wells back and getting gas to sales as soon as possible and, and not venting and whatnot. When we first started our, after our discovery of the federal shale, we were flowing wells back just about like everybody else did uh, to a tank, an open top tank. And then once things cleaned up a little bit, we'd run it through the production system. We, we pioneered the green completion and having these mobile units. And uh, I never will forget our chief legal officer, who was also a geologist, testifying and, and speaking at a uh, uh, some sort of a presentation at MIT. And the API was claiming there's no way on earth that green completions are economic. Well, wait a minute. Oh, 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 hold on. We have evidence to prove otherwise. And we did. And we actually. You know, it cost a lot of money, but guess what? We were selling a lot more gas. So it took some thinking out of the box to do that. So that pushed the industry along in the sense of other people said, well, you know, these guys over here said you couldn't do it economically, so I'm not going to do it. But these guys are proving that it can be done. So you do it by setting the example, right? Uh, that That's one that is just kind of always on the front of my mind that that happened for us and uh there's many more examples of you know integrating services uh you know we did other things uh in in how we kept costs down uh as the price of gas started coming back down after those big high peaks in the early early 2000s um we cleaned up a uh a uh, an old uh, uh sand mine outside of little rock and uh, got rid of some environmental problems. And, and instead of paying Slumberjay or Halliburton seven or eight cents for sand, we, we got it to our well sites for three. So uh, nobody stipulated that you had to do that, but there was a lot of hurdles and environmental things and, and regulations that we had to jump and hoops we had to jump through to make those kinds of things happen. So maybe that helps it, uh, answer your question. 
uh, I think when people get busy and they work together and their attitude is one of we're doing these things because we want to do them as opposed to have to do them, good things happen. They really do. Uh, it's not necessarily always the case, but it often is. And just to bring it back to your testimony, so that um, experience and what you've been sharing with the board this morning is what informs your recommendations in terms of the language. Is that correct? That, yes, ma'am. That, okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, well, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Ms. Paranos, um, any redirect? No, no redirect. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alexander, for your testimony and um, Ms. Baranios. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, we need a break. Uh, let's come back at 11, please. <laughs> 